Joining me now are two of the top economists in the country from Chicago, Diane Swank, chief economist at Mesro Financial. She's a former advisor to Federal Reserve Board and Regional Reserve Banks. And here in New York, Michelle Meyer, senior U.S. economist at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. She is a former economist at Lehman Brothers. Ladies, welcome to Bottom Line. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank Good you. to be here. Uh, Diane, let's start with you. As our economics editor, Michael McKee, was telling us a, a, a little bit of good news today, and Michael, uh, I guess tongue-in-cheek, was noticing that he hasn't been able to deliver a lot of good news during the year, but uh, better-than-expected business in Chicago, new orders on the rise, but then we still have that sticky jobs problem. Diane, gauge from January until now what this economy has been through, what you've seen. Oh, gosh, it sort of feels like reminiscent of last year where the economy started to look like it was going through a more a bigger recovery at the end of the year and then lost a lot of steam. Um, we haven't seen a lot of momentum in the in the first half of this year, sort of a 2 percent less than potential growth. Um, we did have some job gains out there and then they petered out. Some of it was transitory and Mike hit the nail on the head. The Japan situation really did disrupt production and we are seeing production come back much more rapidly in the U.S. Um, from that Japan disruption than we thought it would, and that's good news. Unfortunately for Japan, the production, the energy, they're um, diverting it to the production facilities, and because it's gotten much hotter much sooner in Japan than they expected, mm. they're having even more rolling brownouts. So for all those who are not working in the production facilities, the energy is being diverted there, and there's a lot of people who are in very sweltering office towers. Um, I have a friend of mine in Japan who said he couldn't even, he was trying to get a, you know, a, 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 a soda in the soda machine and couldn't read which coins, he couldn't see in the dark which coin to use and so clearly for Japan the worst of the problems are in the third quarter yeah. but we're going to start coming out of it in over the summer. Michelle Meyer are you seeing that same sort of phenomenon playing out two steps forward one step back for this economy for the first six months of the year? Yeah, Diane summarized it perfectly. I think what we're seeing in the beginning of the year is probably mostly a soft patch. Um, a lot of it has to do with the production slowdown, and you see that if you look at the auto data. We had a very sharp decline in auto inventories and autos production, and auto sales as a result fell very sharply. We get auto sales uh, tomorrow for the month of June, and we think we're going to see only a modest payback. So uh, there's a lot of residual effects from what happened in the production slowdowns, and of course we'll see a bounce in the third quarter. Um, but in our view, it's not just that the production story. There's other factors as well. There's the lagged impact of high gasoline prices. Right. Consumers are still responding to that. Uh, Diane, Swan, uh, Diane, if I might ask you, because today, June 30th, last day of the month, also the day that the Fed said it would end its uh, purchasing program, its purchase of assets there, the end so-called of, of QE2. What type of effect has that had on the U.S. economy? Well, you know, I think the biggest impact of QE2 was the buoyancy it helped to create in terms of people taking on more risk and going into equity markets. The buoyancy we saw in equity markets earlier in the year and late in 2010 helped to lead the way to the strongest IPO market we've seen since 2000. And why is that important? Because on a lag basis, IPOs are a major generator of jobs. So they're not generating jobs at the moment, but all these companies, some of them may be in bubble territory. Remember the, the LinkedIn, some people worrying about that being a bubble. Right. But the, the those IPOs being able to issue so much money, hitting a critical mass where they can actually start hiring up and ramping up on hiring and their interaction with established firms. I think yeah. that's one of the biggest impacts of QE2, and I think it's one of the most overlooked effects of QE2 as well. Uh, Michelle, that uh, IPO market that Diane was talking about, seen a lot of M&A going on this year, a lot of IPOs this year. Is that indicative of something that maybe Wall Street is seeing in the economy, perhaps some light at the end of the tunnel? Because unfortunately, a lot of regular regular Americans don't see it that way. No, I think that's right. The corporate sector has been the bright spot of this recovery, particularly large corporations, those that can access the corporate debt markets, can borrow very cheaply, and therefore have a lot of cash on their balance sheets and are ready and, and hopefully will start to be more willing to invest. But it has been somewhat of an uneven recovery in that um, the smaller businesses haven't been able to access credit quite as much, so new business formation has been slow um, thus far. And also in terms of of the wealth distribution, again, financial assets have rallied, and that's certainly a positive for the overall economy. Right. But 
most Americans, their largest asset is their home, and that's still falling in value. Right. And, and ladies, I'm, well, I'm sorry, Diane, you wanted to jump in real quick? Oh, I just wanted to underscore that, because um, the unevenness really in terms of income strata and income distribution, really, the recession revealed the incoming qualities that were already there. The right. debt no longer could paper over. But now we're seeing it even more because many middle-income households depleted their 401ks and their 529s when right. wealthier households doubled down on those market dips and were yep. able to make their money back. They're already past high watermarks. And Michelle, I'd like to start with you. Uh, the jobless situation, you and I have talked about this before uh, earlier this year. It, it seems that that doesn't seem to gain any traction right now. The unemployment rate is still over 9%. And one of the more insidious things that I note during this economic crisis we've been going through is a, a lot of men have been heads of households. And if they lose their jobs, then their wives become the head of households. But because women in the United States don't make the same amount of money on the dollar that a man does, they still find themselves in a rather precarious situation. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that's one of the consequences of this recession. And um, it, just in terms of the sectors that's been hit the hardest, one of which is construction. There were 2.3 million construction jobs lost um, and pretty much uh, none gained back so far. You've seen some increase in construction work because of public construction, uh, because of renovations, but it's been really slow. And most construction workers are, are men, and, and therefore you are seeing that dynamic because of the type of recession we were in. Um, and I I think it speaks to a bigger picture. It speaks to the fact that households in general are dealing with slower income growth and they're dealing with uh, still distressed balance sheets. Uh, it's going to take a long time to work back the wealth that was lost during the recession, which means in our view, we're going to be in a period of, of higher savings. And uh, Diane, that period of higher savings, how long will that last? Well, you know, we're really probably only halfway through a very multi-year cycle, if not longer. Um, this is something, what, one of the things that struck me, I was just in um, Amsterdam with a lot of international economists, and one of the topics was, you know, this, the banking crisis, the financial crisis in the Nordic countries, Sweden, fin Finland, and um, Norway, and they did everything right and um, fixed their crisis. Um, hit the financial crisis of the most recent financial crisis, came out of it at the V-shaped recovery. But one of the charts that really struck me, and I had a conversation about this, was the high, ra the low rate of labor force participation and high rate of long-term unemployed. Right. And they said after 20 years, that never came back. In fact, they never hit the pre-crisis lows on unemployment that they had hit before the crisis, after the crisis, even though they did everything right. And that's something that gives a lot of disturbing, very disturbing to the United States, because we don't have the safety nets that they do um, in those other countries. Right. And so we're going to have a lot more working poor. And I think Michelle's right. The, the financial distress of families is going to remain out there. And that's not something that can easily be wiped away. I think we're going yeah. to see a lot of people really moving down the job chain because they're not going to have no choice. The 99 weeks are running out. They don't yes. have any other source. There is no safety net. So that's something that we really haven't dealt with yet. And I think it's still to come. Uh, ladies, we have about two minutes left in this segment. Uh, Michelle, I wanted to start with you. Final thoughts. What do the next six months look like here in the U.S. for the economy? I think they're going to look better than the first six months of the year, um, in part because production uh, gains are going to pick up as Japan gets back online. So that's going to be a natural bounce to the economy. Um, but the underlying trend may not look all that different in the sense that you still have these issues we've been discussing, the repairing of the balance sheets, bottoming out in the housing market, um, and a return to a higher confidence level. And, and it's going to take time. So in our view, we're looking for 3% growth in the second half of the year, which is about a percentage point higher than where we were in the first half of the year. Right. And we think that the unemployment rate will reach about 8.7% by the end of this year, only a gradual decline. Uh, Diane Swank, that jobless rate, uh, is that going to be, at least for the next six months of the year, the thing that stalls a full-fledged economic recovery? Um, I think it's just what Michelle said. It's part of the jobless rate. It's the whole household financial situation. And what was interesting is, you know, the layoffs you were talking about earlier in the program on Wall Street as well. Wall Street in the high end is the part that's holding up the consumer. And we got in a little breather on energy prices. If energy prices were to bounce back up, that would cap the consumer a little bit too. And so you do get a natural bounce, but the bounce is like a dead, dead um, tennis ball or a mm -hmm. dead cat bounce at that. And I think that's going to be our real struggle is this sort of growing but not enough, not enough. Yeah for the bulk of Americans to feel good about it. Diane Swang, Chief Economist, Mesro Financial, joining us from Chicago. Michelle Meyer, she is the Senior U.S. Economist at Bank of America. Merrill Lynch, joining us from here in New York. Ladies, thanks so much for your help. We appreciate it.